All right. So the next speaker is Julian Ingham from Columbia, and he'll say talk about theories of Van Hove singularities in Kagome metals. All right. Thank you very much for the organizers putting this talk together and for inviting me. Uh, yeah, this is a talk that's going to be based on this paper from last year and a whole bunch of stuff that ideally should be coming out on archive very soon, but you, you, you never know. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm trying to squeeze in a lot. I'll probably fail to cover everything adequately. So that's only giving you an excuse to talk to me afterwards for more details. All right, so, oops, this one doesn't work. So to begin with, uh, the most important slide, I'd like to thank my collaborators on these projects. On the theory side, Raquel Kiarosh from Columbia, Ronnie Tamale, many of you know of, uh, from Würzburg, as well as Armando Concilio, who was at Würzburg and has just moved to Bologna, at University of Technology Sydney, Harley Scammell, uh, Tommy Lee, who at the time was at Free University Berlin, as well as Oleg Sushkov, uh, UNSW. On the experimental side, the experiments I'm gonna talk about were done by Heim Badenkopf, of Weizmann. Uh, we heard a bit about the experiment at the beginning of this conference, uh, as well as Yuxiao Zhang of the Hassan group at Princeton. Okay, so the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to talk abstractly about electronic band structure and Van Hoff singularities. Then I'm going to talk a bit about Kagame metals specifically. And then I'm going to try to talk about three instances of Van Hoff singularities playing an important role in these materials first in the 135 materials, then in the 166, and lastly in the surface states of this vile semi-metal cobalt tin sulfur. Okay, so the richness of material science comes from the interplay between kinetic energy and potential energy. So magnetism, superconductivity, giant magnetoresistance, all of these interesting effects come from the fact that the kinetic energy of the electron in a crystal exhibits stark qualitative differences to that in the vacuum. And uh, the unusual momentum dependence of the energy can, in turn, uh, with the introduction of interactions and impurities, result in a bunch of interesting phenomenology. So one of the most famous instances is that of the graphene family. So when twisted, just in monolayer ordinary graphene, the honeycomb lattice results in the electrons near the Fermi level essentially behaving as if they're ultra relativistic, des described by an effective Dirac equation. In untwisted Bernal stacks, of graphene. Uh, there's an interesting phase diagram as a function of carrier density and displacement field, so a vertical electric field applied to the material, uh, showing superconductivity as well as spin polarized states. Uh, even at higher temperatures, without looking at superconductivity, uh, Bernal bilayer graphene, uh, you know, the tunneling between the two layers produces uh, a band touching which is quadratic instead of linear, and the application of displacement field opens up a gap. So this is an atomically thin semiconductor whose gap can be controlled via an electric field. Um, and famously, recently, twisted bilayers of graphene, the interference between plane waves hopping between the two layers results in a massive suppression of the propagation of the electron, resulting in these uh, relatively flat bands near the Fermi level in which the role of interactions is enhanced compared to kinetic energy. So a canonical example of how kinetic energy can be strange in solids is that of the Van Hove singularity. So um, a Van Hove singularity is a saddle point in the electronic dispersion at which the group velocity vanishes. So it's a momentum for which the electron is stationary, something which is completely inconceivable in the vacuum of space. Um, uh, and so the vanishing of the group velocity results in a divergence of the density of states. Um, and so a massive enhancement of interaction effects. It's almost as if at this at this very particular momentum point, the energy is completely dominated by interactions. There's some dispersion as you move away. And so there's uh, a rich and interesting uh, set of uh, instabilities of a system whose Fermi surface is located near such a point in the electronic structure. Uh, and indeed, as promised, uh, there are several material examples of systems where the Fermi surface is located near a Van Hove singularity, and correspondingly, uh, frequently we see uh, interesting charge ordered phases in proximity to superconducting states. So, uh, Kagame metals, no references here because I'll discuss it in depth in a few slides. We also have strontium ruthenate, certain transition metal dichalcogenides like lead telluride, lead ditelluride, as well as quite recently these experiments on Moiré uh, twisted. 
uh, tungsten selenide, uh, where correlated insulators and superconductors appear right next to a Van Hove singularity, as observed in uh, magnetic resistance. Okay, so these uh, saddle points uh, seem very peculiar. This is an unusual dependence of the energy on momentum, but as unusual as they may seem, they're a non-negotiable fact of any band structure uh, for topological reasons, in fact. So in two dimensions, the Brillouin zone is topologically equivalent to a torus. So if I go one, out one end of the Brillouin zone, I come in through the other. And so this direction and this direction are periodic, and we can map the Brillouin zone to a two torus. Uh, now, the energy momentum relation, the dispersion, which assigns an energy to everywhere in the Brillouin zone, is a smooth function defined on a torus. And there's a theorem from Morse theory, which studies manifolds via smooth functions defined on them, which says that if you have any such smooth function on a compact manifold, the sum of the maxima and minima of that function minus the number of saddle points must equal the Euler characteristic, which is zero for a torus. And this is sometimes called the Poincaré Hopf theorem. So for two dimensional dispersion, the number of saddle points must equal the number of maxima and minima. So in any two dimensional dispersion, no matter what you do to the hoppings or whatever, you will always have Van Hove singularities somewhere. Although it's not guaranteed that they'll be near the Fermi level. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, visually, it kind of makes sense if at some point you have a minimum, uh, sorry, yeah, a minimum. Uh, and at some point you have a maximum. If you, have, if you go between them somewhere or another, you're forced to have a saddle point. Okay, so with those preliminary comments, uh, we're going to talk about Kagame systems. I don't need to spend too much time on the introduction given the conference. Uh, it's a lattice of corner sharing triangles. Historically, people have been very interested in insulating compounds for the reason that the lattice is geometrically frustrated, and so they're a natural candidate for spin liquid states. But there are also, in addition to geometric frustration, uh, other interesting properties relevant to metallic systems. So just the simple nearest neighbor type binding model on the Kagame lattice produces a type binding dispersion that looks something like this. We have these two bands very similar to those of graphene, where we have Dirac points and Van Hove singularities, as well as this flat band that arises due to destructive interference between hopping processes. Um, and so in the last uh, 10 or 15 or so years, people have studied a number of interesting examples of metallic Kagame systems, starting with these half Hoysler materials, these 3-1 compounds, uh, and then later these 3-2 and 1-1 uh, compounds. Many of these are um, some sort of transition metal uh, intercalated with uh, some other element, usually tin or germanium, and many of these interest, exhibit interesting magnetic properties. So there's a large anomalous Hall effect in these 166 and Hoysler materials. Um, iron, tin, and cobalt tin have flat bands that live either a bit above or a bit below the Fermi level. Doping, interpolating between the two by doping produces an interesting phase diagram. Uh, and so this, this was sort of the status of Kagame metals sort of from the mid 2010s through to around five years ago. Um, so uh, unlike most of the previous examples of Kagame metals I mentioned, so this family of compounds, which has generated an immense amount of interest, starting from about four years ago, uh, are not based on iron or cobalt, but rather vanadium. And so you might naturally expect that these compounds are less predisposed towards magnetism and therefore more favorable, perhaps, towards superconductivity. Uh, so again, I'm not going to spend too much time given the conference, but yeah, these 135 materials, as they're now called, where this uh, alkali blue atom can be cesium, uh, potassium, or rubidium, they're a stack of weakly coupled layers. There's a Kagame net of vanadium, as well as a honeycomb net of antimony and this uh, triangular lattice of alkali metal. Um, so these new compound, this new family of Kagame materials, uh, they're superconductors at low temperatures. At high temperatures, there's a charge density wave somewhere around 90 to 100 Kelvin, depending on the material. Uh, it's seen in STM as well as X-rays, so it's a bulk phenomenon. Um, and uh, oh, 
some candidate phases that people thought about when this charge density wave was first observed are these so-called R and I charge density wave phases. So this uh, RCDW is a periodic modulation of static charge um, forming either this uh, um, uh, inverse star of Davin pattern or the so-called trihexagonal pattern. And this ICDW phase, uh, which is also called the loop current phase, can be thought of as the same sort of pattern, but instead of these uh, bonds being formed by static charge, they are loops of current. So this is also called the loop current phase. It's odd under time reversal because the loops move either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Or more formally, you can think of this I as picking up a minus sign when you act on it with time reversal. So I don't want to spend uh, too much time on background, but it's worth mentioning a bunch of other interesting properties uh, that of observations that have been made. So the materials exhibit multiple superconducting phases as a function of pressure. A similar phase diagram exists as a function of doping. Uh, at some lower temperature, the charge density wave breaks rotational symmetry as well as translations. Um, STM sees some evidence of the superconducting gap being spatially modulated although this experiment is perhaps a little controversial. It's only supposedly reproduced recently. Uh, somewhat, perhaps most exotically, there's some indications of incipient uh, formation of 4E and 6E condensation. So an ordinary superconductor, some superconductor is a condensate of pairs of electrons. And these oscillations in the magnetoresistance give some evidence of quarter and uh, sorry, half and third flux quantization, which suggests condensation of quadruplets or sextuplets of electrons. And uh, the materials also at some temperature quite a bit lower than the charge density wave transition exhibit uh, extreme sensitivity to magnetic field and strain, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a couple of slides. So the application of uh, slight strain fields or magnetic field uh, results in a very strong response with anisotropic transport or uh, chiral transport. So anisotropic resistance, depending on the direction of the magnetic field. So a recurring question uh, is whether time reversal symmetry is broken in these compounds or not. So these materials are not magnetically ordered, but there are a variety of signatures people have seen, which are indications that time reversal symmetry is broken. Uh, and so this caused a flurry of excitement with many theorists suggesting the charge density wave is the ICDW that I mentioned earlier. Um, so in historical order, these were the observation of the anomalous Hall effect, uh, a non-trivial coupling of the Bragg peaks of the charge density wave to an applied magnetic field seen in STM, uh, an increase in the relaxation rate in mu SR, and uh, the Kerr effect where you shoot um, linearly polarized light at the material and see elliptically polarized light be reflected, which tells you that left and right circularly polarized light were reflected differently. And so you've broken time reversal. Um, but um, in, as, uh, as time went on, uh, the, an increasingly uh, conflicted picture has sort of emerged with all of these experiments. So first of all, there's no hysteresis seen in the whole effect here. As B goes to zero, there's nothing. So that's not really evidence of uh, time reversal symmetry breaking. Rather, there's a very large magnetic field induced response. Uh, second, so something is seen in MUSR around the transition temperature of the charge density wave, but the biggest increase in the relaxation rate uh, you can sort of see here, happens at quite a lower temperature, uh, around about 40 or 50 Kelvin. And, yep. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> That's just what the uh, title of the, it's not anomalous at all, because <laughs> there's nothing at zero field. Yeah. yeah, perhaps I should delete anomalous from the slide. <laughs> it's just in the title of the paper. Um, yeah, so indeed it's not anomalous and it's not evidence really for time reversal symmetry breaking. Uh, so, and some groups say that they see no Kerr effect and others say that they do. So taken together, this at the very least suggests that there's um, 
at best a complicated relationship between the charge density wave and the possible breaking of time reversal symmetry. Um, so something which has received much less attention, which um, offers some possible resolution of these conflicting observations, is there seems to be something else that happens in these materials inside the charge density wave phase. So somewhere around 40 Kelvin or 50 Kelvin, whatever it is, the transition seems to be quite broad, a bunch of interesting things are seen. So um, in the elasto resistance, so you apply strain and you measure the resistance, there's this massive peak that appears um, around about here, 40 or 50, whatever it is. Uh, there's some feature that's seen in the pneumatic channel, but the largest contribution is in the symmetric channel. Uh, at around about the same temperature in very, very low strain devices. So when you put your sample on top of a piece of glue, a droplet of glue or a silicon nitride membrane uh, and completely cancel out the coupling to the substrate, uh, there's this unusual uh, magnetic field dependent anisotropy in the electric current. So we can think of this as being some contribution to the free energy uh, that goes something like this, some coupling between magnetic fields in plane and current out of plane. Um, and uh, around about the same temperature as well, uh, modest, the modest application of modest uh, magnetic fields seem to introduce strain. So uh, just anisotropy in transport. So uh, this can be thought of as some contribution to the free energy that goes as strain times uh, out of plane magnetic field. Um, so there are these unconventional responses that appear around about the 50 Kelvin mark. So the uh, chiral part appears to only um, emerge in samples that are extremely low strain. You apply some strain, this thing disappears. Um, and instead you get this anisotropic transport. So some of these like uh, symmetry breaking patterns seem to depend very, very sensitively on whether the material has been exposed to training fields or to even small amounts of strain from coupling to the substrate. And so this offers some possible explanation for why people see different things. Um, around about the same temperature, uh, I should also say, you know, there are these new peaks that appear in Raman scattering. So there are a bunch of probes that say somewhere around 50 Kelvin, something happens and it breaks symmetries in some interesting way that depends on the external probes the system is subjected to. Um, so yeah, from a symmetry perspective, you can think of a bunch of these as uh, in terms of uh, these, um, these susceptibilities. So the um, magnetoelectric coupling, uh, piezomagnetic coupling, electrostriction coupling, these are tensors that are non-zero uh, the couple electrical magnetic fields, strain and magnetic fields, and strain and electric fields. Okay, so with all of that experimental background, I'm going to transition to theory by talking about the role of electronic band structure in the formation of various ordered states. So I'm going to start by discussing the problem of interacting electrons with a hexagonal Fermi surface. So a Fermi surface is unstable to superconductivity whenever there's a weak attractive interaction. Uh, but a hexagonal Fermi surface has something called the nesting property that says when you shift your momentum by some uh, vector Q, uh, as I go from say outside the Fermi surface here to inside the Fermi surface here, my dispersion picks up a minus sign. Uh, and so in this situation, the Fermi surface is unstable towards the formation of a density wave state a uh, periodic modulation with this wave vector Q. And the reason for this is that, um, oops. the reason for this is that it costs the system zero energy to create an electron and a hole separated by this Q because they have opposite energy. And so creating this electron hole pair costs zero, zero energy. And so the instant there's any effective attraction between the electron and hole, the system can lower its energy by spontaneously creating many such pairs and the ground state becomes reconstructed. So in order to self consistently determine the ground state, you have to simultaneously treat the instability towards superconductivity and density wave order on equal footing. Um, and this problem of the hexagonal Fermi surface was studied by Nankashaw, Levitov, and Chubikov, where they found that chiral D-wave superconductivity always wins for weak repulsive interactions. Um, but I should mention also that similar work was done 
very long ago in the context of square lattices um, motivated by the cuprate superconductors. This was discussed in Shree's talk. Um, uh, okay, so on the other hand, when you have two Fermi surfaces, one made of electrons and the other made of holes, i.e. the momentum derivative of the dispersion has opposite signs uh, on these two Fermi surfaces, the, firm, the system is unstable towards the formation of a condensed state of electron hole pairs. So if I have one Fermi surface for which my dispersion is say k squared and another for which it's minus k squared, then I have the nesting condition, but with q set to zero potentially. So here I've drawn these two bands separated by q, but if I stuck them on top of each other, so I had a q, k squared and a minus k squared, I would have the nesting condition as on the previous slide, but with no momentum separating them. So this is a translationally invariant order parameter, which hybridizes these two Fermi surfaces. We refer to this as an exotonic uh, instability. There's an approximate U1 symmetry corresponding to the um, uh, difference in the number of electrons and holes, and it breaks this. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so actually, this situation arises in the ion nictides, where there are hole pockets at gamma and electron pockets at m. But in that case, the pockets are separated by finite momentum. So you can think of that more as conventional nesting, where there's not a zero here, but there's a nesting vector. But there's a pocket that's like k squared and another that goes as minus k squared. So the vanadium metals are special because they're a material where exactly both of these scenarios actually coincide. So this is. Um, the band structure from DFT, there are several Van Hove singularities near the Fermi level, and you can see that we have two which disperse downwards in the MK direction and one which disperses upwards. So just focusing on two of them, we have two opposite concavity saddle points. If I go along one direction, one's K squared, I go along the other, it's minus K squared. So we have this situation. And so in order to uh, consistently understand the instability of the system, we have to treat these exotonic orders on equal footing with superconductivity and charge density wave. Um, and the reason this happens can be understood in a simple type binding model. So um, two of these Van Hove singularities basically come from the DXY, sorry, DYZ and DXZ vanadium orbitals. And so we have a type binding model that looks something like this, where we have different hoppings for the two. And then the difference in crystal field splitting for these two orbitals produces a different on-site potential uh, for these two orbitals. And when uh, the difference in crystal field splitting equals the sum of the two hoppings, the Van Hove singularities are shifted so that the sort of valence band saddle point and the conduction band saddle point of these two sets lie very close to one another. And this condition is very nearly satisfied actually for this orbital content in this material. Okay, um, I'm not going to spend too much more time, uh, but uh, a lot of the details of uh, these three Van Hove singularities, which sit near the Fermi level, and their orbital content are discussed in these two Arpez papers. Uh, there's a concave, um, there's this K2 prime band, which disperses upwards along MK, and this is mostly the DYZ uh, orbitals, oh, sorry, the D. Uh, XZ orbitals, and then there are these two downward dispersing ones that come from DYZ, and there's this flatter one that's sort of pale orange, which is almost a higher order Van Hove singularity that comes from the DZ squared and X squared minus Y squared. But this Van Hove singularity disperses quite a bit more in KZ, the others are very two dimensional. Um, okay, so we now follow the standard approach for interacting Fermi surfaces near a Van Hove singularity, where we write down an effective theory restricted to the near vicinity of these so-called patches. So the density of states diverges at these corners of the hexagonal Fermi surface here and here. So we have two uh, hexagonal Fermi surfaces. One goes from positive to minus energy as you go from in to out, and the other vice versa. Um, and we have a single particle term in which we have correspondingly the energy of these C electrons being something plus, the energy of these D electrons being something minus. Um, and so now, the next thing we do is we write down all possible couplings allowed by momentum conservation, which scatter you either within or between the two flavors, uh, as we'll call them. Um, I won't force you to look at it for too long, but that's what you get. You get uh, 16 possible scattering processes. I'll make that go away now. Um, and then 
what you do is you look at all possible weak coupling instabilities. So the nesting condition gives you a tendency towards spin and charge density wave order. The ordinary instability towards superconductivity is there. Now we have these excitonic states, which can be single or triplet. And interestingly, actually, this model also contains a weak coupling instability towards pair density wave order. So in the single hexagonal Fermi surface problem, um, because the energy flips sign as you go between different patches, there's no tendency towards superconducting pairing between different patches. But I can flip my sign again by jumping to the other um, Fermi surface. So actually the energy at one of these patches equals the energy on the other Fermi surface shifted by Q. So the result is that there's a weak coupling instability towards pair density wave order in this model, which is a novelty. Um, uh, I'm going to skip discussing this too much, but uh, the fact that actually one of these Van Hoop singularities is M-type, the other is P-type, so they have different sublattice support, has an important role in uh, which of these couplings uh, is non-zero at the bare level. Okay, so what do we do with all this mess? To determine the dominant ground state at low energies, you, we use the perturbative renormalization group procedure. So you start with some cutoff lambda, around the Fermi surface and you progressively lower this cutoff, integrating out electrons in this shell, and you see how the effective couplings evolve as you systematically go to lower and lower energies, uh, closer and closer to the Fermi surface. And as we do this, we look at how the susceptibility of these uh, different order parameters evolve. So we look at the susceptibility towards excitons, density wave, and superconductivity, and near a phase transition, the susceptibility should diverge. And so this is the order parameter with the most divergent susceptibility is the order parameter which becomes the dominant ground state. So we can analyze these equations in two different ways. On the one hand, we can make some universal statements. So generically, this renormalization group flow results in your effective couplings diverging um, as you uh, lower your temperature, but they diverge at fixed ratios of each other, which we call fixed rays. And there are actually only a finite number of possible fixed rays. Uh, at, and so at very low temperatures, there's only, even though there are so many scattering processes and many order parameters, there's only a handful of possible orders which will dominate uh, at very low temperatures, or in other words, as you integrate very, very close to the Fermi, and the Fermi level. Um, uh, but we only reach long RG times or low temperatures if our couplings start out sufficiently weak that uh, we don't get an instability very quickly as we integrate close to the patch. So um, we can complement this weak coupling analysis of seeing what possible weak coupling instabilities there are by taking estimates of what the initial values of all of these couplings are using ab initio results and then just integrating the RG equations and seeing what they say the dominant ground state should be. Um, so unsurprisingly, perhaps given you know, the single Fermi surface model had D-wave superconductivity as the leading state. Uh, we find that typically the dominant state is this uh, singlet uh, as D-wave um, excitonic uh, order, so a D-wave hybridization of the two Fermi surfaces, um, which has some structure which um, changes sign as you go from Van Hove singularity to Van Hove singularity, which if I cont continue these order parameters around the Fermi surface, these two orders which appear as leading ground states can be thought of as like cos two theta and sine two theta. So it's kind of like a superconducting state. It has a U1 phase. It's not a superconductor. Uh, it hybridizes these two Fermi surfaces and the order parameter can be cos two theta or sine two theta. Um, so this is kind of similar to the D wave Pomeranchuk order that's been discussed in ion based superconductors. So we have these D wave states um, and when we explicitly take couplings from DFT and integrate, uh, we find a flow of the susceptibilities that looks something like this. Near around 100 Kelvin, uh, it seems that the couplings from ab initio estimates uh, tend to favor charge density wave order, even though it's not uh, the dominant weak coupling stability, uh, instability. So excitons appear nearby charge density wave if we take the ab initio couplings uh, but charge density wave still wins. 
So we have a situation where we have a charge density wave instability, and close nearby, we have this D-wave state that hybridizes the two uh, Fermi surfaces. Um, and so we know both from experiment and from our explicit integration of the RG equations that charge density wave order appears uh, at higher temperatures than anything else. And so it's worth asking the question, how does charge density wave affect uh, the excitonic state? Uh, and this is a non-trivial question. You have to compute the Landau-Ginzburg free energy uh, for coexisting uh, charge density wave order C and phi, this excitonic order. And non-trivial result is that for some finite range of couplings, um, the, the X and Y axis are the, um, you can think of as the coupling which induces the charge density wave or the exciton, some finite wedge, uh, actually there's coexistence between these two states. So they don't compete with each other, they actually coexist for some window of uh, phase space. Um, okay, so this is a possible resolution to the observation of charge density wave order and not time reversal symmetry breaking, uh, or the observation of all of this other symmetry breaking which appears uh, beneath the charge density wave transition temperature, that there's actually a coexisting phase that's separate to the charge density wave itself, which can potentially have some novel symmetry breaking tendencies. Uh, so why, how do we, um, what possible novel symmetry breaking tendencies does this state uh, offer us? So as was sort of discussed quite a bit in the previous talk, when you have a D wave state, you can combine them either in a chiral combination which breaks time reversal symmetry or a nematic combination where you just condense one of them. So you have an order parameter that's like cos two theta. Um, and so these exit, this excitonic condensate uh, at mean fields, uh, if you assume the, this excitonic state uh, condenses uh, and is a true ground state of the system, uh, you get something that breaks time reversal symmetry and with the application of strain or potentially pressure will no longer break time reversal symmetry but will instead break rotations. Um, but as I discussed in the experimental preliminaries, actually the nature of symmetry breaking in these materials is uh, quite unusual. Around about 50 Kelvin, something funny happens where only in the presence of strain or magnetic fields do these materials seem to break time reversal symmetry or rotational symmetry breaking. And so to understand the probe dependence of the symmetry breaking, we came up with this idea um, in this paper to work to appear shortly with Ronnie and Harley of a uh, vestigial excitonic state that could appear around 50 Kelvin. So this excitonic order parameter uh, because it has a U1 phase uh, due to this approximate uh, particle hole symmetry, um, you might think that in a quasi two dimensional material, phase fluctuations should melt this order parameter. So there's this order parameter which has a spin vector and a U1 phase, uh, and in a two dimensional material, you might actually think that fluctuations should give you a zero expectation value for this thing. Um, but by linears of this order parameter, uh, you know, it's like multiplying different components of this order parameter with itself uh, will not have a U1 phase, will only break discrete symmetries. And so if this thing is non-zero, um, uh, so, and so it's possible for phase fluctuations to make, reduce the expectation value of this thing to zero, but not um, various combinations. So if I take the spin and charge components of this, um, order parameter, I can take various combinations which are either scalar, axial vector, or oh, one of those should be vector, not axial vector. Um, and so um, the result is that you have this order parameter which is melted by phase fluctuations, and when you apply strain or apply a magnetic field, depending on what you apply, you stabilize one of these combinations of the order parameter manifold. And so when you do this, you find that you can reproduce the probe dependence of this symmetry breaking. So um, for instance, here's one example, I'm not gonna go through all of it on this slide, but the electric magnetic magneto chiral anisotropy, this coupling between B and I, you can get from uh, the uh, magnetic field induced combination that looks like this. Uh, applying strain gets rid of this and gives you some 
anisotropic transport. And using these arguments, you can similarly explain also specular optical rotation, the absence of Kerr effect, uh, the superconducting diode effect that was recently seen, as well as these additional peaks that appear in Raman. How much time do I have, by the way? Okay. Um, so I might skip a few things. So I wanted to make some comments on the 166 Kagame metals as well. So this material scandium vanadium tin uh, actually has a very similar um, uh, electronic structure. So these ARPES results also saw opposite concavity von Hofer singularities near the Fermi level. And interestingly, there also appear to be tentative indications of time reversal symmetry breaking from USR. Um, and so actually among this family of 166 compounds, this is the only one that has a charge density wave and the only one that has found where this unusual hidden magnetism has been seen. Uh, in very recent STM work, uh, an additional phase is seen to appear underneath the charge density wave transition, which is seen in this material. So there's a charge density wave that appears around 90 Kelvin, uh, around about 70 or so Kelvin, uh, this anisotropy in the Bragg peaks appears, uh, this nomadic state. Uh, and um, in QPI, correspondingly, something is observed where we have two bands which cross each other, and then uh, this band crossing is gapped out at two of the three Van Hove singularities. Uh, so we get something where we have this kind of dispersion initially, and then uh, only two Van Hove singularities remain underneath this 70 Kelvin transition. So in some ways, this is almost like a direct smoking gun evidence of this type of excitonic instability. You have two opposite concavity bands which cross, they gap out and they produce a state which doesn't break translational symmetry. Uh, so uh, in this unpublished work, we put together a minimal model of this material. Um, the two Van Hove singularities near the Fermi level are both P-type, unlike the 135 case. That leads to some differences in the analysis of interaction effects. Um, basically, the physics is dominated by on-site interactions. It's kind of the opposite situation to what Tree described yesterday, where the on-site Hubbard U renormalizes to zero. Um, and we found that either Hund's coupling or the um, uh, renormalization group flow beyond the mean field level can promote the, these D-wave states, which would, in the presence of strain, potentially produce the pattern of nematicity seen in the experiment. Um, yeah, I wanted to also talk about this cobalt tin thing. I don't have enough time, so I will simply say uh, in a couple of minutes that this is another material which exhibits Van Hove singularities, another Kagame metal, but in an interesting twist, these are Van Hove singularities which only appear in the band structure of the surface states. So if you cleave this material so that the Kagame layer of cobalt atoms lives at the surface, then there's this one band, uh, this, the surface states are dominated by this one band which have a Van Hove singularity very close to the Fermi level. And the way that these cobalt atoms are coordinated is the upward pointing triangles have sulfurs underneath them, the downward pointing triangles have sulfurs above them, and so when you cleave on this cobalt surface, only one set of the triangles have sulfurs underneath them, as you can see on the right here, and as a result, the cobalts here bunch closer to the sulfurs to which they bond very tightly. Um, so this breaking of the symmetry by cleaving on the cobalt surface caused these cobalt atoms to uh, bunch up and form a distorted or breathing Kagame lattice. Um, and basically we found that as a function of this distortion, the Van Hove singularity becomes increasingly flat. And so instead of an ordinary saddle point where the dispersion goes as kx squared minus ky squared, you get something that's closer to kx squared minus ky to the four. And the pattern of uh, symmetry breaking in this material, the weak coupling instabilities, uh, are then importantly different to the ones I described in previous slides. So you can see the Fermi surface looks like this distorted hexagon. This is not nested. And so as a result, there's no tendency towards charge density wave order. Instead, there's a tendency towards non-translational symmetry breaking states um, like this uh, charge pneumatic, which possibly explains the, um, the nematicity seen in the STM experiments. Okay, so that's my talk. Um, kinetic energy in a crystal, 
is modified in strange ways. Near a Van Hove singularity, uh, the Fermi surface becomes unstable to a bunch of different interesting order parameters depending on uh, the nature of the Van Hove singularity. Um, and uh, many Kagame materials seem to exhibit Van Hove singularities near the Fermi surface, but um, several of them differ in subtle and interesting ways. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Questions? Um, in the almost last part of your talk, you mentioned about the nematicity stabilized by Hunz coupling. Mm -hmm. Can you? Uh, it sounds very interesting. With uh, it, I, I don't really figure out what you mean here. Yeah, I didn't explain it right. super well because I was rushing. Um, so the excitonic state, so the two Van Hove singularities arise from different orbitals. So one of these Van Hove singularities comes from the dz squared orbitals of the vanadium, and the other comes from the dxy. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that because these are p-type, um, the, at a given endpoint, the this is a plot of the charge density near one of the endpoints. And for one of the Van Hove singularities, it's completely concentrated here. And for the other, it's completely concentrated here. So if you want this band to interact with this band, they're very strongly bunched on one site. And so the physics is dominated by some sort of on-site interaction. Now, if you have a Hund's coupling, which couples different orbitals on the same sites, that's a coupling between these two, um, uh, these two bands. And it turns out that after you do a particle hole transformation, this effectively acts like um, an effective attraction for D wave hybridization of the two orbitals. I didn't really provide any details, but I'm happy to elaborate more later. But basically, it's because Hund's coupling couples these two orbitals, and so it promotes an excitonic state which hybridizes. So, do you orbitals. expect a similar thing can happen in the uh, 135 compound? Um, yes, actually, uh, but it's a little bit different. Uh, because the on-site Hund's coupling is... So in the 135 compound, I didn't elaborate on it uh, a lot, but here's the band structure. Um, so the two opposite concavity uh, Van Hove singularities, this K2 prime and this K2, uh, one of these is an M-type Van Hove singularity. So the sublattice support is mixed over two sublattices. The other is P-type. And so you don't have this complete suppression of the nearest neighbor interactions. Um, and so a bunch of other couplings are more important, like the nearest neighbor Hubbard is important. But yes, even in this situation, the Hund's coupling does promote uh, D wave. Okay, and finally, in your, I mean, the previous case, 166, uh -huh. probably your Hamiltonian doesn't have any V, v term, am I right? Uh, My Hamilton. I just want to check. Um, Which, uh, what about this? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, do you have an inter-site correlation term here? Oh, I just wrote the single particle. Oh, okay. But I, um, but we used the same extended Hubbard model uh, to look at the bare values of the couplings as in 135. I'll just show that again. Yeah. So this has oh, okay. on-site U, it then has U prime, mm. which is on-site but couples the two orbitals. There's V. Is a V prime which isn't written, and then there are these horns and exchange couples. Okay, thanks. Uh, Julian, just a, a, a quick question. One was just to understand a little bit more about the singlet versus the triplet excitonic order parameter, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the form. Mm -hmm. um, so, just for my for understanding. The second is that because you have a free energy which couples the excitonic order to the CDW order, mm -hmm. does that constrain the form of the excitonic order that could be allowed because, especially for the singlet versus triplet channel or the form factor itself? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, so I don't think it makes it, so starting with the second question, I don't think the CDW makes a difference for singlet versus triplet. Uh, basically, they both couple as like, exciton squared, CDW squared. So whether it's in the spin or charge channel doesn't make a difference. Now, if the CDW breaks rotational symmetry, this would promote pneumatic excitonic order. Um, so it's possible that, uh, 
anisotropy in the CDW could promote the nomadic combination. The first question, singlet versus triplet. So singlet versus triplet excitons are degenerate in the limit where you take the exchange interaction to be zero. Um, so actually there's kind of a near degeneracy between the two. Um, and this is something that uh, is well studied in the context of like excitonic resonances and semiconductors, this like near degeneracy. So actually in the vestigial story, we exploited both, um, uh, wherever it is, we exploited both the singlet and triplet state. We made use of both of these to get all of the responses. Actually, I should mention that, um, yeah, it's difficult to explain all of these things using a scenario that only has charge density wave order, um, because you need to posit many different possible order parameters, like multiple charge density waves, in order to simultaneously explain uh, both of the both the pizza magnetism and the electromagnetic chiral anisotropy. So both of these um, and excitons get around this, but we did have to cheat a little bit by saying that there's a near degeneracy between singlet and triplet, but there is like a microscopic justification for this cheating. We have time for a couple of short questions. Uh, anybody? Okay. Uh, Yasser, do you have any an announcements you want to make? Or? Well, first, let's thank uh, Julian. Uh, <laughs>